morning, Toronto. Everybody awake? You guys can go ahead and have a seat. You know, it's really, you guys can sit. I feel like I sit. Good. Excellent. So far, this is going great. All right, you guys are doing great. You know, I was thinking it's just really great to be here. Somebody reminded me this morning that it was 15 years ago that we first discussed having a Steubenville Youth Conference in Toronto. So 15 years of prayer, planning, and dreams, and we're finally here. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So I came in on Wednesday to go to a Blue Jays game. Yeah. Blue Jays uh, beat the Brewers in the bottom of the ninth walk-off home run by... That's right. So go Blue Jays, everybody. I believe this morning your uh, greatest tennis player at the moment, Bruchard, is playing in the championship of Wimbledon right now. I think that would be your first women's champion in Wimbledon, so come on, Bruchard, kick a little booty, all right? Amen? It was just really great walking around. I've been here for the last couple of days, walking around, remembering really wonderful things. Uh, Parish of St. David's, you're out here somewhere? When the Holy Father had World Youth Day here, I brought a group of about maybe 300 young people in St. David's hosted us. So uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be back in Toronto. Amen? So this morning, we're going to talk about God is real. So if you're on, sitting on the floor, I want you to say, God, when I point to you. God. God. Say it like you mean it. God. Not bad, not bad. This group over here, you need to say is. is. Okay, we need to actually say it with some energy, all right? Okay? Like there's about 12,000 people from the Lions Club next door um, that may still be sleeping, honestly, all right? So we need to keep them awake. So. I didn't even tell you guys what to say. <laughs> Seriously, this is the smartest group I've ever been with, all right? Amen. It's a really good question. <laughs> so you're not the only smart one, huh? That's a great question. And it's a question that's been being asked more and more, as Bob said. They did a study in the United States in the last 20, in the last 10 years, 25%, there's been a 25% increase in people who don't believe in God. Who, who, who they don't believe in his existence, don't believe that he's real. So it's a question I think we need to take a look at, and I've got some helpers to help me with that this morning. So it's Emma. Okay, Emma, come on, stand up. Let's give it up for Emma. Okay, uh, where are you from, Emma? Cambridge. Cambridge, like, I'm going to assume that's Canada, not yes, like it's England. Canada. Okay, all right, all right, <laughs> cool. And you're somewhat of an artist? Yes. Okay, and hold that up just a bit. Okay. And you're creative? Yes. So, like, when you're thinking about creating, you kind of think about what you're going to do if it's art or something like that, and you create it. You, you have to get inspired, but yeah, you think about okay. what. So, you could probably create, like, a, just a really simple artistic drawing or something like that. Okay, I'd like you to do that. I don't have anything to draw with. Well, I, I thought you were creative. <laughs> and then you can, can just, wait, 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 wait. I know what you might want. Okay. This will help, I'm sure. Yes, Here's your will. board. Okay, so. No, just there. Okay, so create something. Draw, just draw something with some paint. I don't have paint. I thought you were creative. I am creative, but you need stuff to create. You need something to create. You need stuff to create stuff. You need stuff to create stuff, really. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? You need stuff to create. OK, 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 it might be able to help. Okay. You're really actually pretty high maintenance, honestly. <laughs> OK, so it, now you have paint. I have paint. You have a board. Yes, I do. So you could create something. Yes. So I'm not actually going to have you do that here. You're going to take this, and you're going to create something, and Bob is going to let you display it in the front of the room today, all right? So take that with you, create something. Amen? Okay. You can have a seat. Give it up for Emma, okay. our creative. Can I actually create something? What's that? Can I actually create something? Yeah, yeah. You can act, not only can you create something, you have to create something, all right? <laughs> you don't have to do it now. I prefer you to actually listen to, to what I'm saying here. All right, Emma. Thanks. 
You know, it's really great what she said. You have to create some, you have to have something to be able to create something. Now, you can't create out of nothing. What there are is there's things called the proofs of the existence of God, and she mentioned it better than I. One of the proofs of the existence, existence of God is that you, you can't create out of nothing. I mean, she, I asked her to create something very simple, just a little, but she can't do it because there was nothing there, huh? And one of the proofs of the existence of God is that something had to be able to create because there was a time when we weren't and there was a time when all of this wasn't. So something had to bring creation. Something had to create out of nothing, of which Emma can't do, but apparently somebody can. Huh? So, so we raise this question about how do you create out of nothing? So something that is eternal is the only thing that can create out of nothing. So to create out of nothing, something must be something before the nothing was, and that nothing is? That nothing is? Because, and that's one of the coolest things about God, you guys, is, is that he creates out of nothing. There had to be something from the very beginning so as to be able to create. In all of our world, there's, there's an order to God's creation. One of the things that they speak about is that there's an intelligent design to creation. Did you know that trees do not have an app that tell them when to shed their leaves? It doesn't happen, but trees can't think, but there's an intelligence to trees, huh? And they know because of creation and order that there's a design to this, that there's a time that they actually should, the, the leaves should fall off in sun and winter. And, you know, we don't have to remind the sun to go around. It's just always going to go, we're going to go around the sun, huh? And there's going to be winter. And this year, winter seemed to go forever. But you know spring's going to come because there's an intelligent design to all of this, huh? And as scientists begin to study more and more about God, they see, they see the intricacies of the design, and, they, and now they can look at molecules, and, and it's just remarkable how, how intricate this is, and it simply couldn't be an accident, amen? So for all of this to be created, there had to be an uncreated creator, and that uncreated creator is? Because? Amen? All right, so we're going to have you help us out. Your name again is? Say that again, Brandon. They're going to turn it on. Brandon. All right, Brandon, you're from where? Where are you from? Uh, Keswick, Ontario. Nice, nice. It's good to have you here. All right, now he's going to help me out a little bit here. So you just stand there. Just entertain them for a second, all right? Um. Awesome. You nailed it. You may have a future in this. You really might, all right? Okay, uh, Brandon says he's a little bit of a, of a golfer, so we're gonna see how good of a golfer he is. So you need to stand over here. Just don't cross that, do not cross that line, all right? No. Okay, you see that? That's your goal right there, that cup. So camera, you can put it a little on our little cup here, all right, all right? Brandon, your job is to get that, let's make a bet. Who thinks that he can actually get this ball in that cup? Anyone? <laughs> okay, do not cross that line, all right? Okay, Brandon, I'd like you to get that ball in the cup. <laughs> I can't reach it. Just think, think more about it. You, you can move it. Anything? No, it's crossing the line. So what do you need? What do you need to be able to make that? What do you need? You need a putter? I think so. That'd be nice. All right. Don't worry, I've gotten all over that. <clears throat> All right, so he said he needs a putter. This, my friends, is what Tiger Woods won his first Masters with. <laughs> Did you guys see that 11-year-old girl who made the U.S. Open? 11 years old. This putter is bigger than she is. It's remarkable. All right, so there's your putter. So now, now you've got a putter, you've got a ball. Wait, I didn't say you could touch it. All right, go ahead and touch it. In fact, you can go ahead and step up. I'll take the mic, give it a shot. All right, the pressure's on, you can come up here. One more time. <clears throat> yeah, baby! It's yours. You, you keep that and you get some practice. All right, you guys can actually go sit down if you want. Let's give it up for them. They did a great job. You can go ahead and keep that. You can keep it. Take it with you. 
Yeah, yeah, you can make something and, and then, yeah, show it to us later. You practice your golf. If you make a million dollars, remember me. <coughs> you know something? Scientists tell us today that all of the world is in a stage of movement, huh? That, that the universe is expanding, but it's, and we think about the immensity of the universe, and it just, they throw around numbers that are just beyond me, but it's constantly expanding, it's constantly in movement, huh? And then on the other side, when they took, the, that's the huge immensity of the, of the universe, but when you take a look at a molecule, just the simple molecule, and they look at it, it's also moving. So one of the proofs of the existence of God is that there had to be something that began this movement, or the words that they use is there had to be something that caused this movement. So we had that golf ball there, and if he was going to be able to move the ball, that there had to be something that was going to cause that ball to move, all right? So I give him a putter, but it wasn't enough that there was a putter, because there had to be something that caused the putter to move so that the putter can move the ball so that the ball can so what is this we have an existence one of the proofs of existence of god is the unmoved mover that there was something that was before that caused this movement to happen we could stand here for a week and that ball isn't going to move there has something that's going to have to cause that so there had to be a cause to that so the proof of existence that we talk about is that god is an uncaused cause huh he's the one that always or he's the unmoved mover amen and that is because god is real amen and it can't just happen, huh? You know, science talks a lot about the existence of God right now. And there was a day, as Bob mentioned, for centuries, for the longest time, when scientists believe in God. Scientists were, were men and women of deep faith. And it's only recently that science is distancing itself from God. But I want you to hear is that there is not this distance between science and the belief in God. That you can actually go and you can go to universities and you can study the existence of God. Amen? And we can study, as I just talked about, the proofs of the existence of God. And for centuries, many, many centuries, decades, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, we've had these existence, these proofs of existence of God that we can actually prove from a scientific uh, understanding and method that there is a God, that there has to be something that began all of this movement. There has to be an unmoved mover and uncaused cause. Amen? Because... Science believes that necessarily if you can't touch it or you can't measure it, you can't see it, then it must not exist. But we know that that's not true because? You see, science, the, the group up there is kind of like psycho. I like it. I like it. Because science can't tell us everything about God, you guys. And that's one of the struggles today is we live in a world where science is trying to move and impinge on on God, and science can't tell us everything about God, nor can we who have faith or we who believe in God tell us everything about science, amen? That's why they have to work together, and Pope John Paul was really big about this, that there's faith and there's reason, and those things are not always in conflict, and yet this often time the world is growing to say that, that they are in contact. You either, either have to believe in science or you have to believe in God, but you can't believe in both, and that isn't true, amen? That there isn't a conflict. But science wants to really dismiss God, and this is a new phenomenon. For most of history, the greatest, the greatest scientists were also men and women of faith. But we have an attack against religion. So science can't tell us everything about God, and God can't tell us everything about science. Or we can't tell, those who study God can't tell us everything about science. And that's why it's so beautiful when we work together. And, you, and my father's a physician, so he had to do science and all these kinds of things. And it was kind of weird, but my dad would always have us, everyone hold out your hand in front of you, all right? My dad, and look at your hand. My dad would have us look, it's really weird, all right? He goes, look at your hand. And he says, this is an amazing thing. Science can't, can't create this. That, that what your hand can do in your wrist and all that, and he was always like amazed. He said when he was studying science and before in med school, he was amazed at the human hand, huh? And what it can do. Science can't create that. Science can't create that. And the other thing that science cannot do is science could not prove that there is not God, huh? We can speak of proofs of the existence of God, but they cannot prove that God does not exist because. So if God exists and he's real, what is he like? And so oftentimes what we begin to talk about, when we talk about what is God like, we actually begin to talk about um, behaviors. So, so people will say, you know, all religions are basically the same. Have you ever heard that before? All religions are basically the same. And there is one line of truth to that in that most religions talk about how we treat one another. What's the golden rule? Bob mentioned this uh, this morning, you know. 
Um, do unto others as you would have them do. That, that's not just Christian. Jesus didn't make that up. He had heard that from other people, Buddhists and Muslims and, and Christians and Jewish people. They all believed about that basic tenet about taking care of one another. Amen? So one of the things that when we begin to talk about God, we actually don't really talk about God. We talk about behavior. So when people say that all religions are the same and they say treat each other, that's behavior and God are different. Amen? So who of you have heard of Veggie Tales? Of course. Of course you have, because we get our theology from a talking tomato. Amen? Huh? Amen. So one of the things, the, author, the creator of the Veggie Tales, he actually just wrote an article, and he said he was sorry to everybody, because what he said is that I was, what my goal was to talk about God, but what in fact what I was talking about was morality and behavior, because lots of religions have similar, not exact, but similar behaviors or similar moralities, but there's a distinct difference between morality and who God is, amen? And sometimes we get stuck and we get lost in the morality. And different religions talk about morality, but there's something about that, that, that we can talk about morality, but that has nothing to do with God, amen? It has nothing to do with heaven. It has nothing to do with hell. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has, so we can talk about these things, but we never actually talk about and God is the one that we have to talk about. God is the one, the reality that we have to be able to experience and to prove that God is real. So then, who is God? What is God? This time I'd like you to say something else. 1 John 4, 9 says... That God is love. Yes, He is. You know, it's interesting. I had the opportunity a couple of times this year to go to China, and China is a is an atheistic culture, and it's changing. It's really, it's actually, it's quite amazing what's going on in China right now. But you know, we can't really fully comprehend what it means to be raised in a society without God. I mean, you, you drive down the streets here and you see churches all, all over the places and you see signs of faith and all these kinds of things, huh? But in China, that's not what it's like. And I was meeting with a couple of young couples and I was just talking to them about their faith and, and how is it that in the middle of China they, they were Catholic and what was that like? And, and one of the gals there, her name was Teresa and Teresa was born, uh, and not, not, she wasn't born Catholic. Now, some of you always say, well, I was born and raised Catholic. You weren't born Catholic, amen? Nobody is born Catholic. You're actually born little monsters, all right? And because somebody loves you, they brought you to the church, and you're baptized, and you become Catholic, amen? <laughs> Teresa was raised in an absolutely atheistic home. She was an only child, as is most people in China, because they have a law there that says you can only have one child. Teresa's father was a communist official, and he was very, very active. And from the time she said, from the time she was a little baby, she was constantly told by her father, there is no God. God is not real. She goes to kindergarten school, and it is constantly reinforced everywhere around her, people telling her there is no God. Well, when Teresa was 16 years old, she began to ask questions like, what is life about? Huh? What is life about? What's the purpose of life? And the way she expressed the story is that she was always asking the purpose and the meaning of life. If you ever ask that, what's this about? Huh? You get up in the morning and what is it about? What's life about? What's our purpose? What's our meaning? And Teresa, as a 16-year-old girl in communist China, was asking the questions, what is the purpose and the meaning of life? A big question for a 16-year-old. When she goes to university, she begins to study art. Now remember, God wasn't even in the horizon. It wasn't even a part of her, her vocabulary. God did not exist for Teresa. So she begins to study art, and her reason for studying art was she believed that art would give purpose and meaning, that you can look at a beautiful piece of art. You wouldn't look at something like that in, in China, huh? You look at a beautiful piece of art as Emma's going to create for us before the weekend's over, and, and there's this sense of... of beauty and purpose and meaning that you can look at art and it can kind of stir something. So Teresa figured that that was where she was going to find purpose and meaning in art. She was a junior at the university and she was looking at a beautiful piece of art and in the back of her mind she heard, art cannot give purpose 
Art cannot give meaning. Art cannot feed the poor. Teresa said she had this crisis. You see, she was under the understanding that art was going to give her purpose and meaning. She lived in a life void of God. And in the middle of this crisis, she began to ask again, there has to be something more. So she was walking through her city one day, and there was a Catholic church. And she walked in the back of the Catholic church, and along the side, of the, on, the, on the wall of the church, in the Catholic church, she saw written, God is love. She didn't know who Jesus was. She didn't know who the Christian God was. She didn't know that Jesus died for her sin. She didn't know any of that. But she looks at that text, and she says, God is love. And she said to herself, if that's true, that's what I'm looking for. That will give me purpose and meaning, if it's true. Teresa made an appointment with a Catholic priest and about a year later was baptized Catholic because she began to believe that that is true. That God became real for her by his love. And no matter where we find ourselves, you guys, when we speak about God, that we speak about the love of God, and that radically separates us from the other world religions. I remember I was in Jerusalem one time talking with a really, really cool guy that was a Muslim, and we were just having a really great conversation. It was one of the most honest, real conversations. It was a guy who worked in a store, and we just started talking, and, and talking about our faith, and, and him being Muslim, and me being a Christian, and, and it was just really an honest, cool conversation. And then I began to talk about the God's love for us, and, and how God reveals his love for us, and how God, we can call God Father. And Jesus didn't just say father but he said daddy and, and the guy that i was talking to he said no he goes that's where we differ and i go what do you mean he goes god is not daddy god is not love he's he, he's firm he's he said when you talk about him like that you talk about like god is close but god isn't close god is out there and and, and I, I understand more clearly this distinction that we have, that, that all world religions don't believe the same, even though we talk about God. When we talk about God as love, brothers and sisters, we are talking about something that is understood very uniquely as being Christian. That the other world re religions are going and they're searching for God and they're looking for God and they're going out there, they're seeking peace or nirvana or, or whatever it is, something that provides some sense of peace. And in, in that search, they're looking for, ultimately, they may not know it, they're looking for love. And that we as Christians believe that God is love. Now, the last couple of days I've been walking along around, around the streets of Toronto and I'm seeing all over the place uh, little signs that say, love is love. What does that mean? Love is love. You guys, I love Tim Horton's sour cream Timbits. Seriously. As soon as I come to Canada, I feel home because of Tim Horton sour cream Tim. You don't get the mix. You get sour. I love those. Now, is there a difference between my love of Tim Horton's sour cream Timbits and God's love for me? I certainly hope so. <laughs> but the signs out there say love is love. Many of you now, and I know that this to be true, have had people that have said that they love you. And you now know that that's not true. And you did things or were part of things because of somebody loves you, huh? That saying out there that, that I see on the streets that say love is love, what does that mean? What does that make sense? If, if God is love, well, what does that mean? We look again at 1 John. First John 4, verses 9, just verse 9. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only son into the world so that we may have life through him. That is love. I mean, when, when we hear love is love and we want to try to understand, okay, God is love. Well, okay, well, what does that mean that God is love? John tells us that God reveals his love to us in this, that he sends his son. In John three sixteen, God so loved the world that he sent his only son. So when we begin to speak about love and we begin to try to understand that love is always about Jesus, amen? 
that Jesus reveals the love of the Father to us. And how does he do this? He reveals this love that is, is first and foremost, it's sacrificial, that God proves his love for us, we hear in Romans, that while we were still sinners, he proves his love for us. And he suffers and he dies. That is love. It's not that the, the scripture says that, 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 that they did not take his life, but Jesus gave his life for me so that I can know what is love. You see, this is radically different, brothers and sisters, from all other world religions, that, that in Christianity, we don't just go looking for Jesus. Jesus comes looking for us. It's not us about just going and finding him, that Jesus comes and he searches us and he takes on flesh and he becomes one of us, brothers and sisters. That is love, amen? And that's craziness to the most of the world religions, that our God would take on flesh. And not only that he would take on flesh, but that he would allow himself to suffer. And he would allow himself to be crucified. That he would come and he would look for us. This is love. And that Jesus ultimately reveals to us his love. And he reveals to us what, it, what, what heaven is. And he reveals to us the way Jesus says in John's gospel, I am. And, and Bob referred last night about the, the text in the Old Testament, God saying, I am who am. Jesus says, I am. That I am the one. I am God. And then he goes on and he says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. So Jesus reminds us that we are the way, so that if there is a way to heaven, the way we have to get to heaven is the way that Jesus came from heaven. That it is Jesus, brothers and sisters, who reveals to us God. It is Jesus who reveals to us in love. It is Jesus who reveals us what it is to live, what it is to move, what it is to breathe, what it is to have purpose and meaning. It is Jesus who gives life to us. So do me a favor, just close your eyes, take a breath. 